The Celtic Exchange, a fresh insight on Celtic Football Club. Hi folks, I'm delighted to be joined on the Celtic Exchange today by Matt Corr as we take a deeper look at a hugely important time in the history of Celtic Football Club ahead of the release of the brilliant new book, The Celtic Rising, 1965, the year Jock Steen changed everything. Matt, author, Celtic <laughs> tour guide, marathon runner, granddad, you're a busy man. Where do you find the time to get into projects like this? Uh, that's, that's a really good question, Tino. I'm not sure. I guess it's sort of all-consuming at the minute, so if I'm not doing things you just mentioned there, particularly looking after the grandkids, then I'm I'm writing about Celtic or I'm editing somebody else's writing about Celtic mm. and, or I'm doing a tour guide at Celtic Park, so I'll probably need to find a better work-life balance somewhere along the line, but yeah. uh, for now I'm uh, I'm having so much fun, so that's where we are. I'm sure Missy's core is delighted that you're out of <laughs> half the time now, so. Well, that's another story. Yeah. yeah. Um, so before we get into some of the stories of the book itself, Matt, could you tell us a wee bit about how this book came to be? Obviously you've now been involved in a number of books through the Celtic Star, but... Can you tell us how it came to be and also the people involved? So David Potter, author, and I know John Fallon has done the intro, for example. So can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I I guess for this particular book, the idea came from from David Potter itself. I mean, normally Celtic Star books, we're really trying to, I guess, giant jigsaw puzzle that Celtic's history are trying to pick out particular elements that we think will be of interest and make sure that legacy goes on. So either we will come up with a, a project idea and we'll, assign that to a writer or in this case David caught the idea very close to his heart uh, as you'll know when if, if, when you go through the book the, David Potter lived through this particular element the pain and then ultimately the joy so David came with the idea we developed on that and hey presto you know seven eight months later there's a there's this book coming really really excited to see the reaction to that yeah and is that David's era like I, I don't know David Pers I've not met him just yet but was he in his teens at that time yeah. was that his yeah spot on so David read his teens and he'd obviously lived through the lean years I guess maybe we're going to discuss that in some more detail so literally literally that would change David's Celtic support in life so mm. very very close to his heart and that's a perfect background for somebody to tell that story because it's a personal experience yeah. rather than you know somebody I guess quoting facts David lived this he lived the pain and then he lived the joy and that's what definitely comes across so you shared a couple of chapters from the book with me just as part of the research yeah. just to get a, you know, a good feel for the content and as much as obviously part of the book is you know the facts and the, the results and, and what was happening at that time you know around Glasgow and different things yep you then get the the very personal recollections from David, you know, talking about, we'll get to all this, but, you know, his experience at cup finals at Hamden and could barely see and yep. the nerves on the way up. And it's just, it's it's so raw, but it's so genuine from a man who was there and, and lived these experiences. Yeah, that's spot on, Tino. I mean, David puts you in the minute when he's talking about Hamden for the cup final and where he walked and the, the sights he's seen and the noises he heard. It, take, it takes you, I wasn't at that particular game despite yeah. my looks, I wasn't quite supporting Celtic at that, at that particular time but David puts you in the moment and takes you with him and I love that, same with all his books yeah. but in this one I guess very very close to his heart Yeah and it comes across so well So the book itself, it begins uh, on the 1st of January 1965 as Celtic travel to Ibrooks to face Rangers in the New Year Derby Am I right in reading that we hadn't beat Rangers at Ibrooks? And the Derby on the 1st of January since 1921. Did I pick that up right? That is absolutely spot on. I wasn't sure if it was a typo. It (laughs) feels far too long. No, Um, that's absolutely the case. So that's a a tough record at the time. So um, for the Celtic fans amongst the 60,000 crowd, I think they paid three shillings to get into the game on the day. And by all accounts, a day to forget. It went from bad to worse. So Celtic lose the game 1-0. But that was compounded by a, a sending off for a young Jimmy Johnson. Yep. Violent conduct, I believe. That fiery red hair will get him in trouble. Never think you, never. Um, and also Bobby Murdoch, you know, huge favourite, but missed yep. a late penalty, which yep. I think, in, in David's words, it haunted him for the remaining 36 years of his life. It, it must yep. have really stuck with him. Celtic had a chance with that penalty to equalise, but managed to snatch a, a defeat from the jaws of a draw, yep. if that's the right term. Absolutely. So that particular day maybe acts as a, a metaphor in general for Celtic and, and where they were at that point. And if truth be told, they hadn't been in great shape for a long time. The famous 7-1 League Cup win over Rangers in 57 was the last time they'd won a major trophy. So difficult times for Celtic, difficult times for the fans. Matt, what do you think the main reasons for that that lengthy decline were? Uh, it's, it's a brilliant question. I think there's, there's a few factors in there, definitely. So if you take yourself back to 57 and look at that team in general, if you look at some of the fabulous Celts that were in that team in that era, we, we probably underperformed in terms of trophies. But 
post seven, post fifty seven, and I guess one of the things you got a number of players with aging. So you look at like you like say Sean Fallon with thirty six, Charlie Tully in his thirties, we'd lost joke just before it an injury again. So the crux of that team that had won the, the League Cup double, nineteen fifty three, fifty four, was starting to break up. Also on top of that, you had uh, some I guess some some bizarre selection policies at the time or, or transfer. Uh, transfer decision making so guys like Bobby Collins Willie Fernie you know released and sent down to England you know at a time where we couldn't afford to lose them I mean a lot of the evidence sadly at this time is anecdotal but if, if, if stories are to be proved like said Bobby Collins and, and Willie would go down south to help pay for the floodlights or ground refurbishment at a time when we maybe didn't have adequate replacements coming in and there's another factor in there is maybe the way the club was managed Jimmy McGrory is a huge hero of mine but uh, you know, but again, by all accounts, maybe Jimmy in the Celtic manager's role, it wasn't a, it wasn't a great fit. You had a very powerful uh, chairman, and, and Bob Kelly making a lot of the decisions. So the, I don't think the club was well run. I think we were selling we were selling players we couldn't afford to we couldn't afford to sell, and that a team a team had came to I guess to the end of its era, and the, the young ones were just that, that wee bit too young. So a difficult difficult seven or eight years for. I see Celtic supporter as David, as I say, alludes to very clearly in the book. Yeah, and you mentioned Jimmy McGrory, and, yeah. and no Celtic interview should be without Jimmy McGrory. I'm Absolutely. the same, he's a huge hero of mine, and yeah. you and I have got some kind of links with him in terms of St Rock stuff, and, and that's yes. maybe for another story, but yeah. hugely popular figure, still the record goal scorer in British football, I believe, some yes. 550 odd goals, yeah. something like that. Um, and he was a manager for a 20 year spell, so yeah. he was only Celtic's third manager after Willie Maley and Jimmy McStay yep. and then McGrory comes in I think from between 45 and 65 yep. hugely popular as I say yes. but I think it's fair to say maybe some have said that he was too nice to be a manager didn't have that kind of cutthroat thing going on and there was some suggestions that at the time the club weren't particularly well trained and there wasn't any real focus yep. on tactics yep. do you think that's fair? I think it's absolutely fair and, and I say that because I guess it, my job in the tours I've had the you know, I've had the pleasure of talking to some of the players recently, indeed, who actually played at that time, and, and the stories, the stories are horrendous about the way they, the, the kit that they were forced to wear, you know, just the way the club was run, the, the, the general state of the ground, and whatever. It's, I think Celtic maybe played on that loyalty of the, the fan base and the players, the, the the idea of players playing for the jersey, which I do believe in, but I guess there are limits. It, it, it just, it just it doesn't seem to be a great place to be, and that's coming from folk who love Celtic. And played for the club at that time, so it's not. I'm not having a go at the club. I'm just mm. saying this is the way it was. And thankfully, thankfully, as we'll come on to, you know, so, you know that that slowly began to unravel and change. And you've seen that. You know, you will see the, the difference that that made. Yeah. And what about Bob Kelly? So you've mentioned yeah. Bob Kelly, who I think was chairman between '47 and '71. Yeah. So long time there at the club. Yeah. And a lot of folk. Again, it's you know don't know how accurate it is or not it's, you know, yeah. bits I've picked up over the years but a lot of folks suggest that he had just far too much influence on team affairs what's your thoughts <clears> on that? Well that, that's certainly the general consensus and, and, and you're right Bob Kelly's he's quite, a, quite a divisive person I think and a divisive personality I do like to, I do think there's a balance there to be struck though so I think for, for whatever faults he had and, and certainly interference in team selection seems to be a theme that comes up time and time again I mean there was cup finals so Celtic won the cup in 54 I think in I think in 1955 we were again going for League and Cup double narrowly pipped for the league by Aberdeen but we played Clyde in the cup final and we're a minute away from winning the cup and then there's you know one of these crazy things there's a, there's a corner kick taken that the Hamden wind catches it blows it into net and we lose the replay but for the replay uh, they dropped Bobby Collins who's your, your star player at that time they dropped Bobby Collins and if stories are to be believed the reason was he had an aggressive challenge on the Clyde goalkeeper mm. Bob Kelly didn't like that. So it was it wasn't it wasn't the Celtic way. So Bobby's dropped for the cup final replay, and then in the following year, fifty six, it's Hearts a terrible trio, Con Bald and Water. Again, the the play the selection the, the team's playing well up to the point, and for the cup final we have a right back Mike Hockney, suddenly playing it inside right in in the biggest game of the season. So there just seems to be there just seems to hold there seems to be a whole series of different uh, decisions making that didn't really it certainly didn't benefit the team. We paid for them. And as I say, I don't like to speak ill of anyone. Certainly not a man who's not here to defend himself. But the the repeated the repeated uh, comments would be that, that that Bob Kelly had real influence the team. There's another pop point perhaps worth making in there as well is that I don't think that was unique when doing my research for the books. When you're talking about you know reading the, the newspapers of the day about the teams being picked, there are often references to 
the director or, or whatever, or the selection committee or whatever, as opposed to... So I don't think it was necessarily unique to Celtic, mm. but certainly the, the body of evidence would suggest that, that, that Bob Kelly had an influence that, that perhaps would be frowned upon today. I think that's probably been tactful. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fair. And I think we're in a world today where, you know, fans are unhappy about anything at any level of the club whether it's at yep. chief exec level or throughout the board they make their feelings known yep. through social media and otherwise and it's 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 very in your face nowadays yes. what do you think would have been the, the prevailing mood amongst the fans in the approach to 1965 was there a you know from your your own research and, and working with David in the book yep. was there a feeling amongst fans that they were maybe fed up with the way Kelly was running the club yeah absolutely and it probably went beyond that and, and so that you obviously the anger there'd be a series of demonstrations of which interestingly Bob Kelly never seemed to be there for the demonstrations that we made there was always another reason I think David picks up on that in the book quite yeah. well but it, 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 probably more worrying for me is that the anger the anger and frustration had moved towards apathy Mm. Celtic were becoming irrelevant in the overall scheme of things and, and I get you know something absolutely had to change so uh, I, I think apathy is probably worse than anger folks stop caring that's then, then you really have an issue and as I say reading David's account of that that's that's larger I remember my brother I've got an older brother he was at St Mungo's at the time and he always I remember it sticks in my mind quite well that Celtic at that time there was more Patrick Thistle supporters in, the, in St Mungo's mm-hmm. than Celtic supporters in his class I can't really get my head around that yeah. it, stuck, it stuck with me all those years so that's sort of what you are if you think about it. that team was six top flight clubs in, in Glasgow obviously with third Lanark in there as well the clubs like Patrick Thistle came and beat Celtic mm-hmm. at Celtic Park just like, you know, literally the week before the Scottish Cup final and that wasn't a huge shock yeah yeah it's interesting my dad went to the Mungo and he was there yeah. during the 60s so I'll ask him I'll see what his recollection yeah. is in terms of Thistle v Celtic okay. but I would never have thought that um, so mm-hmm. it's interesting that that was the way Glasgow was looking at the time people were drifting from Celtic and, Absolutely. and that's something you, you wouldn't imagine now you know certainly the way things have shaped up in modern mm-hmm. times so as you're saying something had to change you know yeah. the mood towards Kelly and the club leaning into the, the dangerous era of apathy and people were just you know fed up with what was going on and there's a couple of key triggers in January you know very yeah. very important happenings at the club the first thing I think is the return of Bertie Old so he returns to the club on the 14th of January after a few years down at Birmingham City I mean, by all accounts, you mentioned, sorry, if I get the clear, you mentioned that Kelly dropped, was it Bobby Collins, yes. for an aggressive tackle? Yes. And I believe he also thought that Ald had a bit too much of a temper on him, and that was the reason why he let him go. I mean, do you know how that was yeah. received at the time? Yeah, well, again, very similar. So, so Bertie, you're right, Bertie was a character, even in later life. I mean, Bertie yeah. was a, ca- a unique character among unique characters, I would I'd describe him. Back in 59, he played, for, uh, he played for Scotland and the Netherlands, and Bertie got sent off, which was a huge deal at that time. And pretty much for that time, Bertie's, Bertie's time at Celtic was at an end and sold down to Birmingham City. So, yeah, and again, the fans would be asking, well, Ald was a key, well, Bertie at that time was a left winger, mm-hmm. but a key player in the team, uh, you know, a Scotland internationalist at a time when we weren't blessed with too many Scotland internationalists. And here we go again, Bertie's face doesn't fit and down south he goes now. So, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Bobby Collins, Willie Fernie, Bertie Ald, it just seemed as if... in, in Latterly, there would be Paddy Crern, of course, mm-hmm. get to 63, all all very similar, you know, obviously nobody will know the full story, there may have been an element that players want to leave, but if all accounts are to be believed, these players were basically sold by Celtic as opposed to wishing to leave. Yeah, yeah, and I think there must have been huge frustration as a supporter to see, you know, a fan's favourite leaving yeah. at the behest of the, the chairman at the time. Yes. I mean, before we go to cover what was to occur across, you know, the rest of January, particularly on the, the 31st at the end of the month yeah. there... How important do you think Bertie Old returning to the club at that time was going to be in the bigger picture? I, I, again, that's a great point. I don't. Everybody always talks about Jock coming back and obviously the world changing then, and that's absolutely true. But I think Bertie Old, so off the pitch without a doubt, on mm. the pitch I think Bertie was a catalyst for this as well. So you bear in mind Bertie, as I say, established international, goes down, played in the English first division, the English top flight with Birmingham City. Another thing maybe people aren't aware, Bertie, Bertie won a League Cup medal with Birmingham and he also played and beat Inter Milan in the semi-final of a European tournament. They, they, they get beat in the final with Roma, the, the original the Inter City's first cup, which would eventually be the UEFA Cup. So Bertie came back with a wealth of experience and again, that's a that's a huge factor. I'm not sure I'm not sure there's a bigger on-field factor in 65 than that decision. I think mm. it was huge and of course, Bertie himself said that he only came back because he was told that Joke was coming in. So despite the timing, yeah. Bertie's here first. There is no doubt in my mind that the decision to bring Bertie all back, which Bob Kelly would have had to make, uh-huh. having sold him, yeah. could only have been part of the deal or heavily influenced by 
Jock Steen coming yeah. back. So the, the two for me go hand in glove. Yeah, and there's a huge suggestion that Beryl knew exactly that, that Steen yeah. wouldn't be far behind him. Because I read, you know, David puts across in the book that actually the suggestion was Betty might have been coming back to go and join Falkirk. Spot on. Which again would seem madness, you yeah. know, when you think of modern day Celtic yeah. and Falkirk. But at the time, that'd have been a reasonable move. Yeah. And there, there was also a suggestion that he was maybe going to come back and come into a coaching role. Yeah. And I was just looking at the timelines, and I think he was only twenty seven at the time, was, or when he aye. when he returned to Celtic. So I thought that'd have been an, an, an unusual happening if, yeah. if that were to be the case. But he's obviously come back as a player. So fourteenth of January, yeah. and that in itself must have given a huge boost to the supporters and, and to the the club itself. The results in January were poor, to say the least. <laughs> yes. So, as a as a month goes on, we spoke about the the one 0 defeat by Rangers on New Year's Day. Yeah, we've then had further defeats at the hands of Dundee United, Hearts, and we've drawn with Clyde and Morton. Yeah, so you're going into the end of the month without even a, a win under your belt after a number of fixtures, and that was all going to change on the weekend of thirtieth of January. So, yes. a significant weekend in the history yes. of Celtic. Starts off on the Saturday by resounding eight 0 win over Aberdeen at Celtic Park. John Hughes sadly passed away very recently yeah. John Yogi Hughes scoring five of the goals that day yeah. um, but that was followed up on the Sunday by some big news coming out of the club that ex-club captain and then Hibs manager Jock Steen was to become only the fourth manager in Celtic's history yeah. how important was it that the club made such an appointment at that time based on you know all the, the tough times that we'd mentioned and all the struggles and do you have an idea how that news was generally received by the Celtic fans at that time? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of great things in there. I mean, if Carlsberg do weekends, <laughs> Yogi scoring five against Aberdeen, we Sannies, yeah. and an eight 0 demolition followed with Jock Steen coming back. I mean, it probably didn't get any better than that. But you're right. Consi- I often describe Celtic at that time as consistently inconsistent. <laughs> Even Bertie makes his debut, the heroes welcome, and we lose at home. As you mm. say, we lose at home. Test, albeit to, to a strong heart side. And then a couple of weeks later, you're taking eight goals off Aberdeen. Even the Morton game you mentioned, I'm pretty sure we were three goals up. At Capolo. Yeah. And they pulled three goals back. And in fact, the referee blows his whistle as the ball's flying into the Celtic net for a defeat. Yeah. Which, or it had been another one. So, absolutely vital that the, you know, I'd, I'd dread to think what would have happened going into February or March or whatever beyond that time if Steen doesn't come back. It, it literally does not bear thinking about it. Our history would be totally different. Yeah. And obviously, Steen played, you know, by all accounts, fairly limited as a footballer, but a very yeah. good centre half and very much a leader. And he was yes. the the captain when Celtic won the the League and Cup double you mentioned in fifty three fifty four. Yeah, he retired before that fifty seven League Cup final. I believe he had an ongoing ankle injury, yeah. which led to a limp for the rest of his life. Absolutely did, yeah. uh, as per right, David's right. comments. Yeah, and he then went on and, and found success. He managed the reserves for a time. Yeah. took the job at Dunfermline. Ironically, beat Celtic in the nineteen sixty one Scottish Cup after a replay with Dunfermline. Please don't go there. I know. And, <laughs> and my own dad was there as well. I don't think that's fond memories. Yeah. And he then joins Hibs. And at that point, are Celtic fans clamouring for for someone like Steen to come back in? Was he a popular figure amongst the fans at that time? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, if truth be told, yeah, jokes should have been. Uh, back at Celtic Park a couple of years earlier, I think that that's where we are. So you, you mentioned in there when Joke took his ankle injury and uh, he finished up playing. He then led the reserves. When he led the reserves to success at a time where the first team were experiencing none. The, the second eleven cup, I think, it was they took eight goals off your Rangers over two legs. So again, mm. he then he then branches out. You say Don't are struggling at the foot of the league. There's a few games to go. Joke being Joke. He lifts them up and they actually finish something like fifth or sixth from the bottom of the table. And at the end of that, you know. I guess first season that that small part of the first season was there. Then the second season, he takes them to a Scottish Cup win, their first ever national cup final. And, the, and guess who they beat Celtic? And again, we're talking about Celtic Cup final experiences. The sixty ones another one that you know when when, they, when when you're reading David's words on that final, you're actually feeling his pain because Celtic are hitting them with everything but the kitchen sink. Yeah. Eddie Conahan, another big Celtic man, has a game of his life and it finishes a draw. And then of course in the quarter final, and sorry, in the in the replay. The midweek replay, there's another 90,000 or so in there. Celtic have never lost, I don't think Celtic had, had, had lost many cup final replays. Celtic are overwhelming favourites for the final. And then two goals, a crazy goal, at right at, you know, crazy goal, a last minute goal. And suddenly they've lost another cup final, which is, you know, it's, it's now 54 since Celtic's previously won the Scottish Cup. So I think Steen, I guess, I don't know, he creates a bit, he creates a bit of an image, he's, he's successful with his elves. wherever he goes, success follows, he goes to Dunferland, there's some memorable European nights at East End Park, which again, a club like Dunferland, a provincial club with the greatest of respect, had never experienced before and, and would struggle to do so afterwards, and then he goes to Hibernian and he's a success there, so the Celtic fans are looking on and thinking, I guess, 
why is this guy not here? Mm -hmm. You know, why is it Dunfermline? Why is it Hibernian? And we are genuinely toiling. So, well, I guess better late than never. But I think Jockstein could have been there a couple of years earlier than he was. That's that, that's Matt's own personal view, anyway. Yeah. I want to take us back to 61, and I don't want to call you a jinx, Matt, but I, I can't skip by it. So just to get my timeline correct, am I right in saying yeah. you were born just a couple of weeks before that cup yeah, final? Despite these youthful looks, Tino, yeah. that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. I don't know why I was put up for adoption or put in the care immediately, but uh, <laughs> yeah, two weeks after I'm born, we lose the cup final. So yeah. there you go. Them's the breaks. Thankfully, things got a lot better after that. You mentioned something, and I, listen, maybe this is a wee bit sensitive, but you've yeah. talked about the fact that you think Jockstein potentially should have been back at Celtic, you know, long before he was, and yep. there were suggestions that he maybe had conversations with Bob Kelly, you know, 60, 61. Yep. The religious element comes into it, or it's certainly suggested at times by David in the book that, and again, I'm, I'm conscious of being careful about speaking ill of someone who's no longer here to defend the story, but sure. there is a suggestion that perhaps Bob Kelly wasn't comfortable bringing a non-Catholic into the club. Jockstein was to become a Celtic's first Protestant manager. And there's a suggestion that he maybe wasn't comfy with doing so at that time. What's your take on that? Do you think that's potentially the reason why he never came back sooner? Well, I guess the way it, you're right, it's, it's quite a sensitive issue, isn't it? And not knowing the facts, you can only go in and, and what you read and what you believe. So I, I'll answer it in a slightly different way. If that if, if that was the reason why, then it sort of flies in the face of everything that, that Celtic stand for. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's a... I'm not trying to be. I'm not trying to be abusive with that answer, but if that was the reason for him not coming back, then I, you know I, I don't know a Celtic supporter. I, I genuinely do not know a Celtic supporter that would have backed that stand. So mm -hmm. it seems unlikely, but I guess we'll never know. Yeah, yeah. It's just I suppose it's it's in the face of having the facts or the words from our Bob, Bob Kelly. Yeah, we fill the gaps, don't we? You know, we can maybe look at the yeah. possibilities and yeah, and it, because otherwise it's hard to think, as you say such a successful manager, successful on Steen Everywhere, why is he at East End well, Park and not at Celtic Park? Yeah. Why is he Easter Road not at Celtic Park? And, yeah. and maybe it just took a bit longer. And football is a funny game and there's sure. personalities involved and, and different things. But yeah, it would just seem the most obvious thing in the world that he should have been in the dugout at Celtic Park a lot sooner than, but than what he was. Would the, I guess throwing that back again, what would have changed then? Because you did bring him back in 65. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know. It's... I, I hope I hope that's not I hope that's not the reason. I guess we'll never know. I hope that's not the reason. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's worth debating, but yeah, as you say, we'll we'll never really know. Um, so as much as he was uh, announced on the thirty first of January, Steen yep. didn't actually take over on the role officially until eighth of March sixty five. Yep, he agreed with Hibbs that he would stay on until they found a suitable replacement, yep. which they did in the shape of Bob Shankly, brother of Liverpool legend Bill Shankly. Yep, um, and ultimately Jock Steen would be returning to the club where he'd retired as a player, as I mentioned in January fifty seven. He did get off to a good start. He won six 0 yep. uh, away in the league against Derby. That's all good. But difficult results followed. So they went three three league games without a win, defeats yeah. by St Johnston and Hibs and a draw by Dundee. He then records his first official win at Celtic Park over Third Lark on the 3rd of April. It's a narrow 1-0 result. I think a, yes. a deflected effort. Yes. Uh, but bizarrely, he wasn't actually in attendance at the game as he was off on some sort of undisclosed scouting mm -hmm. mission somewhere in England. Which in itself is, is bizarre <laughs> that the manager wasn't there. And again, in the, in the modern day, you couldn't imagine it. Just to segue slightly to Third Lanark, okay. you mentioned just before we, we came on air, the the journeys of each club seemed to take a, a very, a dramatically different route at that time. Yes. Third Lanark had been in existence for the first 77 years of Celtic, I believe. Yep. They were one of the forces in Scottish football, yep. certainly in the early parts. There's lots of links between the two clubs. Behind you, Matt, I don't know if you can see it in camera, there's a, a picture of Bobby Evans, who yes. was the manager that day. Yeah. I believe maybe your dad's favourite player, or a, or a favourite of your dad's. No, that's correct. There's other figures like Tom Maley, brother of Willie Maley, yeah. Tom McAnally, Celtic's bad boy, inverted commas, Evan Williams, yes. goalkeeper in the 1970 European Cup final. There's various links between the two clubs, but as Celtic, as we all know, went on to achieve great European success, Third Lanark were going the other way. Yeah, it's, it's crazy the way that was. I mean, you can take it right back. And I guess the other one you mentioned, Duncan Mackay, who's a Celtic captain, I think, when I was born, actually scored the own goal that, that gave us a win that day. So, so yeah, but uh, going right back, so one of our earlier books was Walford and the Bow Boys that talked about the first season that, that Celtic had. And now our first season, we reached the Scottish Cup final, which obviously this is before the Scottish League was you know, was a thing. So Celtic reached the Cup final at the first attempt. We're beaten by Third Lanark. So they are really one of the established clubs, a preeminent club at the time. And then over the years, as you say, that was the last that that particular match was the last time the two clubs met because third would be relegated. Yeah. And then we drift into second division, all sorts of problems. 
on and off the, the field there. And just a couple of weeks after Celtic became the, the best club in Europe, the European champions, third, sadly, 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 <laughs> uh, we, we were liquidated, basically, they, they ceased to exist. So you're right, the two clubs went and started, in 80 years between, I guess, the, fight, the, the two finals I spoke about, Thurs went out of business and Celtic went from a new club to the best club in Europe, if mm-hmm. not the world. Yeah, so, just yeah, hugely crazy. different stories. Yeah. Um, so I'd mentioned those those tough results, you know, following the the opening win against the Erdry, you know, some poor <coughs> results followed. Yes. And I think at that point it was fair to say that as much as there was obviously a you know a buzz and a clamour for Steen to return, it wasn't going to be a, a quick fix. And yep. he'd obviously inherited a team with some serious talent, but yep. it wasn't going to result in overnight success. Yeah, no, I think you're right. There's, there, there's, I think there's a belief, and maybe the book will help, you know, change that. There's a belief that Jock came in as a magic wand, and things immediately became, you know, magically better, and that, that's not the case. Certainly, the Scottish Cup win, of course, we're going to move on to, I guess, as a catalyst in terms of trophies. But you're right, the first results. There's a, there's also there's a there's a six two defeat at Brockville. There's a five one defeat at East End Park. There's home defeats to Partick Thistle. And part of the reason, I was thinking about that as I was reading through David's stuff, part of the reason for that is Jock was experimenting with a couple of things. So they, they'd, out of all the results they had, you mentioned the, the 6 nothing game the day, basically the second day of Joe's, uh, Jock's tenure, Bertie scores five and things are looking great. The only other really decent result they had in that time was a 4-0 win at Easter Road over Jock's previous team. Mm-hmm. And there's another, there's a couple of things in there. Hibs, Hibs at this time, Hibs, Dunfermline, Hearts and Kilmarnock. Are all, are all vying for the title. Rangers have won the League Cup, but they're nowhere in the league race, and, and neither are Celtic. These four clubs, r- probably reminiscent of where we were in the 80s with Celtic, Aberdeen, Dundee United, these three clubs, four clubs, are all going for it. If Hibs hadn't allowed Jock Steen to move to Celtic, there's a strong case for saying that Hibs might have won the League Cup double that year. Mm-hmm. Jock's last act as the Hibs manager was to knock Rangers out the cup at Easter Road he sort of done that on the Saturday Uh as Celtic were beating Kilmarnock who would become the league champions (laughs) to take over on the Monday it's like his final favourite Easter Road but uh, you know it's a it's a sort of strange one the results did not magically you know manifest and my my belief for that is joke tried a thing I mentioned the Hibs game specifically for a reason sorry the Hibs game the line up they played at Easter Road that night he didn't play that in the league games after it, but that's the lineup that took place and that, that, that took the field in the Scottish Cup final. So guys like Jimmy Johnson, mm-hmm. you know, they, he was getting another wee chance to see when he came, but Jimmy would not appear at Hamden. Yeah. Also Bobby Murdoch, he was trying Bobby Murdoch in different roles. Bobby Murdoch's moved back from being, a, I guess, an attacking inside forward to the a world class right half. He, he had done it once or twice before, but Steen sort of made that a permanent move. Yogi, John Hughes. Originally a centre forward, Scotland centre forward. Joke thought if he play about in the wing, then he's got all that space. He can terrorise the opposition. So mm-hmm. some subtle tweaks of personnel and positional changes, and it took a few weeks, I guess, just to try things out and see how they worked. And thankfully, thankfully, once we got to the cup final, he'd, you know, he was in a position to challenge some Fairman, who's I say were probably were without doubt the favourites that day. Again, chasing a league and cup double up to yeah. seven days before the final. The Fairman were a bit like Hearts and maybe eighty six. They're looking mm-hmm. at a double. They drop a point. Alec Ferguson scores. They drop a point at home, knocks them out of the league race, and the following week they take they take Celtic on. But Celtic, in terms of player for player, you would argue them Fairland probably the stronger side in that time. Mm-hmm. But, but Jock changed it all. It's yeah. incredible. And by all accounts, a very good side as you mentioned. Yep. They're still chasing the league at that moment yeah. in time, and you know they had a lot of quality. They, you know, Tommy Callahan, I, yes, I, feel I think you know pretty well, yes. and his brother Willie, who yes. you know they both played big Celtic fans by yes. all accounts, but. Quality team across the board. A young Alex Ferguson was part of that setup yeah. as well, and, and we'll get to the the cup final shortly. Sure. I mean, I, I've got those results in front of me in terms of <laughs> you know the first one against Airdrie on the tenth of March, right through to the last league game of the season, ironically against Dunfermline on the twenty eighth of April. Yeah. Celtic lose five of those games. They yeah. only won three and they draw one. So across wow. nine games, you've only won three. So a thirty three percent win rate. It's not great, is it? It's not. It, there's not a magic touch uh, evident there. So yeah, that's yeah. really really interesting. Yeah. yeah. So as you mentioned, though, Matt, the Scottish Cup was a, a different ball game altogether. By the yes. time Jockstein arrived, Celtic are already in the the semi finals. They're taking care of St Mirren, Queens Park, and Kilmarnock in yeah. the earlier rounds. He then navigates Celtic to the first major final under his leadership with a three 0 semi final win over Motherwell, having drawn the initial game to yeah. each. And lots of replays in those days. Yeah. Jock Steen would then be taking his side to Hamden to face Dunfermline just six weeks or so after taking on the role. Yeah. So, I'm talking on one hand about no magic wand, no overnight success, but in cup football, listen, the league 
yeah. is, was and always will be the bread and butter and the main target for Celtic Football Club. Yeah. But it was important to get silverware of, of any shape or form, having only or having won the 57 League Cup as the most recent trophy. So yeah. it, was, it was a biggie to get to any sort of final. So he gets us to the final, uh, which was to take place on the 24th of April, uh, 1965. Steen himself, I'd mentioned, you know, he played pivotal roles in those previous successes. So he was a captain of the League and Scottish Cup double team in 53 and 54 before, as mentioned, he had to retire in 57. But at that point, and given the gap in years between the, the trophies, the Celtic fans were desperate for silverware of any sort. And now the club had a chance to go and do something about it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And the Scottish Cup, I guess, has is, is always been a, a, key, a, key, a key element of Celtic's history. Always, it's the, it's the cup that sort of saved a few disastrous league seasons, a few seasons from being disastrous. I always consider it our cup. I know we've won it more than anyone else. But that particular one, you can just imagine rocking up there. So many cup finals. We'd been beaten in the 63 final. We'd been beaten in the 61 final. 55, 56, the whole... Just as winning's a habit, I guess, so there's losing. So you can just can you just imagine how anxious David Potter and the other Celtic fans would be rocking up to Hamden in their thousands, thinking, I guess, praying for, you know, praying for an end to the dark old days. It's yeah. a really hard, diff- given the success we've enjoyed recently, it's a difficult concept just to get your head around in a minute. It's, it's hard to so imagine. Many years, so many heartbreaks, so many false dawns. Yeah. And here's, is this going to be another one or is this going to be the day? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yes. absolutely. So, seven days before the cup final, we play Partick Thistle at home, we yeah. lose 2-1. Yes. That, that in itself is not good news, yeah. but for many, um, the thing they remember most from that day is some really strong comments by Jock Steen yeah. in his match programme notes. By all accounts, they traditionally would be, thanks for joining us at Celtic Park, we hope you have a great day and we yes. hope you get a victory and different things. And apparently he was very strong in his message. And do you want to tell us a wee bit more about that and the effect you think that might have had a, on the players of the time and B, yeah. on the, the mindset of the fans. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very different. You're right. Usually it's a, some bland comments mm. uh, in the programme. But on this particular occasion, so Jock's, Jock's been out, Jock by now has had, I guess, a few games, a few games to make his, his mind up to have a look at what's there and clearly decided that what's there and its current form, it wasn't enough. But he, he went as far as to actually put that in the programme, basically saying the players here, the players have had their chance and there can be no complaints when we go out to, to look to strengthen the team and that's what we'll be doing so a, a really strange message how would that how would that be responded I guess I guess that depends on your own character if you, you're a, a certain types of characters would have taken that as a, as a gauntlet and a challenge to, to get their act together and others perhaps would have, would have, would have fell by the wayside they have been resentful but uh, yeah, you, on, on what was the, given what was to follow you have to argue you, you, it's hard to argue that, that, that it didn't have the desired effect and yeah. given you mentioned earlier that Jock had been away for the third <laughs> Lanark game so part of me thinks there's there's probably some cuteness there. So I'm 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 openly going to look at other games and missing a game, and then mm-hmm. I follow up with that comment. So it's a I don't know it's a get your act together or you know ship up or, or ship out whatever the phrase is. So yeah, yeah. And I suppose it's a it's an indicator Strong at that statement. point of Jockstein's willingness to do things a bit different yeah. and to do things his way. I mean, yeah. I wonder if it's the modern day equivalent of. Avanj Postacoglu jumping yeah. on Twitter and telling guys to, to get their act together <laughs> or, or jumping yeah. on the Celtic uh, YouTube page and, and calling somebody out. But very unheard of at the time and yeah. it clearly... It's a it, shock it's, tactic, isn't it? It really is. Huh? But potentially a masterstroke yeah. as well. It's clearly got the, the desired effect as we'll get Absolutely. to. Absolutely. So the cup final itself, it's Saturday 24th of April yep. 1965, Hamden Park, as you would expect. In terms of the prep for the cup final, Jockstein takes the players down to Largs from the Tuesday to Thursday. I know Celtic yeah. have got a long tradition of taking players to Seamill, yes. but on this occasion it was down to Largs yeah. for a few days. And by all accounts, the argument or the suggestion was to take them away from the spotlight at Glasgow yes. and all the, the noise and, yeah. and stress that can come with that. He makes what I think is the unusual move of announcing his team at 11 o'clock on the Wednesday morning, you know, three days prior to the cup final. Yeah. I suppose just as a small question in the, you know, in the build-up here, was that unusual at the time to, to do to make such a move? Yeah, I, th- I think it very much was unusual. It's, it's understand that Dunfermline, <coughs> the Dunfermline team, I think, was picked in the dressing room. Yeah, sort of. I mean, that may, be, that may be the other extreme. <coughs> but I mean, it's, Steen, you talked, you touched on it earlier. Steen is a master of psychology, wasn't he? He really knew how to get into players' heads, and I think his idea was to give you know give the folk that were playing, give the folk that were playing that that assurance and that certainty, and give them that couple of days just to get their head together and whatever, and also clearly remove remove that doubt. So I, I think it I think it I think it very much was a different a different approach. And again, it, it goes back to your other point here was was Joe using these different things deliberately, just to try and you know again introducing this new regime. Things are going to be a bit different. I'm here. I'm picking the team. I'm doing this. So 
I guess we'll never know we'll never know the answer for sure. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, personally I think it's a good move. It removes that uncertainty. You're in, you're away for a couple of days, you get your head together, you can focus in the player and clearly the players that are not there, they're not sitting, you know, sweat they can also can maybe manage it a bit better for the you mm-hmm. know, for the couple of days leading up to the final. So very very, very unusual. Yeah. I yeah, think but- everything's Steen done at that point was just it was a wee bit you know, you know, you, you never even even in his later years as a manager, you were never. I've spoke to folks who mentioned Tommy who walked under him. You were never quite certain where you stood, mm-hmm. and I think he used that deliberately just to keep that edge and keep that. You know, you could argue it's right or it's wrong. Uh-huh. But do you know there, there, there's a funny thing there um, when you've mentioned that folk never quite knew, you know, yeah. where they stood on them. Yeah. There's some chat recently that Ange Postacoglu said in an interview that that's kind of how he operates. Yes. He doesn't get too close to folks because at that point they get comfortable. Yes. His pet hate is people getting comfortable. You yes. know, he wants people to be out their comfort zone and challenging themselves and not quite knowing where they stand with them. Yeah. And that's why now and then he'll mix up his backroom team or make some changes. Yes. And listen, Ange Postacoglu has a, a long, long way to go if he's to be yeah. named amongst guys like no. Jock Steen but you can see the similarities Absolutely. with the men you know yeah. and they're managing in completely different eras and they're yeah. 60 years apart but some similarities there in the, the mindset Absolutely yeah, it's, it's, it's glaringly obvious that there's a, a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot about Steen in Postacoglu you're right you know it's unfair to make those comparisons in that sense but mm-hmm. I can see an awful lot of similarities Absolutely Yeah no doubt So in terms of the team itself yep. Jimmy Johnson would, mi- would miss out this time yes. around, which in itself yes. would seem un- unheard of. Yeah. Still a young man, I think 21, 22 at that yeah, time maybe. So still a young guy and yeah, his best years would certainly be ahead of him. Yeah. The team itself was John Fallon, Ian Young and Tommy Gemmell, Bobby Murdoch, Billy McNeil and John Clark, Stevie Chalmers, Charlie Gallagher, John Hughes, Bobby Lennox and Betty Old. And there's so many household names amongst that and I suppose it lets yeah. you know, you know, other guys fell away and Ian Young wasn't to be part of you know the bigger success and... Yeah. Um, you know, a couple of different things there, but there was some serious talent in that squad at that time. Yeah, I mean, the, the, when you read it out, there's the, the crux that the, the crux of the Lisbon team's already in place, albeit maybe not necessarily playing in all the same positions. So, interesting thing that I picked up for, for Davis' book was that when Bertie, so Bertie, Bertie came back as a winger, and Bobby Lennox initially was an inside forward, he mm-hmm. played an inside right, I think, in his debut, he was an inside forward. One of the things that Steen did was he shuffled them around. So you had Bobby Lennox playing wide and Bertie playing a bit more with Drum. So he subtly mentioned Bobby Murdoch as well. Jimmy Johnson been out. Stevie Chalmers played in the right wing. Mm-hmm. But as I guess as you know, a youngster watching Celtic, Stevie was a centre forward. Stevie's the yeah. guy that scored the Lisbon goal. So there's, there's a bit of tinkering in there. So the, you can see you can see already there's a, a, I don't know, a spine or a backbone of that team in there. Maybe no, certainly not with the confidence that they would, you know, later to go on to, you know, to dominate in Scotland and indeed in Europe. But the, the, the structure was in there and only only one or two of those guys did not become, you know, did not reach a, a significant number of appearances for Celtic. You mentioned Ian, God rest them, you know, Ian went to, I remember Ian, play, I remember Ian playing against Celtic for St Myrne. Mm-hmm. Jim Craig would come in, but the, the, the crux of that team was already, was already there. Yeah. yeah. We've mentioned John Fallon, the, you know, the yes. goalkeeper at the time. Yes. John would very much, you know, be a part of the Lisbon Lions yeah. and, and, you yes. know, remain so to this day. Yeah. But he was a favoured choice over Ronnie Simpson yes. at that time, yeah. and John very kindly, I know, has written a, an introduction you know, to the book. Yeah. How I don't know, beneficial is it, and how just fascinating is it for yourself and David to be, you know, speaking to these guys, these real heroes in Celtic's history, and getting the, you know the first hand information on, on how it all was at that time. I mean, there's there's no substitute for, for doing that. You're spot on, you know. In this particular case, it was David that spoke to John, and some of the things. John would come away with it, and I guess the most obvious one would 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 John Fallon and, and Ronnie Simpson be rivals? Would that be a problem? But John and Ronnie were actually great friends, and I think there is that thing going on in the goalkeeping fraternity. They yeah. tend to back one another up. Goalies union. But, uh, it's another. There's a, you mentioned Ronnie. Ronnie was my, Ronnie Simpson, my first football hero. I guess I, the first Celtic kit I ever got was the green was the green away kit, but right. I wore it as Ronnie's Lisbon goalkeeper kit, ah, sort okay. of thing, diving across the bed and whatever, <laughs> and driving my mum nuts. But Ronnie was my my first hero. But Ronnie Ronnie uh, had had done it all. It's, it's, it could, we, could have, we could do an interview on Ronnie on his own but Ronnie was actually sold to Celtic by Jock Steen as the Hibs manager mm-hmm. in October I think October 64 the year before so you can only imagine Ronnie Simpson when he hears the news that Jock's the new manager of Jock, Jock, the manager that sold him yeah. three months earlier, is is going to be the new manager at Celtic. So I think that when we're reading Ronnie's book, he said to Rosemary, "Pack your bags, Jock's coming back. We'll be leaving." <laughs> and Jock, at that point, Ronnie's not played for Jock. I think it's something like September before Ronnie Simpson finally gets a game under Jock's team. It's like six months down the line, and of course, 
you know, anybody who didn't know that, who doesn't read this and doesn't hear that, yeah. you assume Ronnie and Jock are, you know, booze and buddies. It was not that case. Jock sold them. Mm-hmm. He was not his first choice keeper at Hibs, it, it, and then he played him in a European Cup final. Yeah, it's, they must have liked something about him. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think Ronnie Simpson, like he came back to the club at 33 or 34, yeah. he'd already had a hugely successful career down south. I think yep. he, did he win the FA Cup with Newcastle in yep. 52 and 55? Spot on. Uh, yeah. He'd done all these things. You could look at it the other way that Jock maybe didn't fancy him at Hibs and thought, I'll just move him on. Or you could look at the conspiracy <laughs> theory that he thought, yeah. I'm going to sell it kind of soon. I could do a guy of his experience and I'll maybe let him go to Hibs on the cheap. So again, we'll maybe never know. Well, that's, if he stories. did that, it's a master's <laughs> thought. That thought has occurred to me in the past. Yeah, so... I don't even if Jock could pull that one we'll off. Never, we'll never quite know the answer know. to that one. Um, going back to that cup final um, in April at Hamden. So Celtic fans dominate the crowd. There's 108,000 in yeah. attendance at Hamden. Yeah. Desperate to see the side bring some success back to the East End. Yeah. As I mentioned, we're up against a very, very good Dunfermline side and one who had also been competing for the league title that season. Can you now, Matt, spend a wee bit of time explaining, this, explaining to us how things all played out on that you know, bright spring day at Hamden? The mood among the fans was one of optimism, but I think nervous optimism, would be fair to say. Yep. And also the way the, the scoring played out on that day, it put the fans through the ringer, didn't it? Uh, it really did. Well, as I say, David, David literally takes you, through the, takes you through the final blow by blow. I, I wasn't at that particular final, but I mean, I've read about it. Having read about it that often, I feel as if I was there. But yeah, they're firmly the absolute the favourites to come in. Lot, lot of nerves, lot of tension. The Celtic and and the Celtic support and on, and on the pitch. They're firmly, of course, get the the straight first to score blood. And there's a a really under it. under I don't know if undervalue this fair, but certainly we don't often talk about Charlie Gallagher as a hero in that final. But and Billy Billy scored the winner and, and gets the glory. But Charlie and Bertie Ald were pivotal that day. Because the, the Celtic's first equaliser, he's probably seen it in the clip a million times. Charlie picks up the ball in midfield, does his wee shuffle, and then he hits this incredible shot. It's screaming at the top corner, hits the old square square crossbar at Hamden. Yeah. Instead of going, as it would now, back into the park or, or into the crowd, it, it literally goes vertical. And then Bertie shows all his experience and everything else. The goalkeeper's grounded. And Bertie gets in ahead of t- Willie Callaghan that you mentioned earlier. Bertie's, act- Bertie's actually hanging in there, just waiting to nod the ball into there. It's a wonderful scene. And then, of course, it's a roller coaster. It's Celtic It's Celtic all over. And the roller coaster, we're back in the game, the crowd's up. And I'm feeling we get a free kick. We're getting towards the, the Hamden whistle. And something I'd never heard before, and, and David D- David caught. And I'd never heard this one before. I'd be interested to, if the viewers know this one. As they're taking the free... They're feeling we get a free kick up towards the Mount Florida end. As they're taking the free kick... There's an announcement, there's a stadium announcement, a tannoy announcement, and David's thought is it seemed to sort of deflect attention and everything else, and of course they take a sort of quick free kick, Chap McLaughlin whips it in, and suddenly we're going in half time, 2-1 down, and not many teams, I guess, come back twice in a cut final to win. So then you get the second half, I guess it's the biggest 45 minutes of your life as a Celtic supporter, isn't it? We can't afford that, we just can't afford it. We've got a new manager in, Celtic lose the cup final, all that momentum is, is gone in an instant, isn't it? And then we're back to it's the same old days, we can't win, we can't do this. But all of a sudden, Bertie and Bobby Lennox in this new inverted role I mentioned earlier, and Bertie's belting through into the box to take Bobby's uh, cut back, and suddenly it's two each. And then by this time, Celtic pile it on, pile it on. And I guess Be- Billy McNeil always spoke about the fairy tale. Well, for me, you know, Billy's fairy tale started that day, didn't it? Yeah. Joke's day, and another thing we hadn't touched on that maybe earlier, another thing that Joke introduced was was releasing Billy McNeil from his defensive duties to go and attack corner kicks. And they'd got a bit of joy with it. But I guess nobody maybe, it was Charlie Gallagher, fabulous corner. I don't think Charlie ever enjoyed being remembered for taking two corner kicks. But if you're going to be remembered for anything... Then Boyd's Vadina in the cup final, Mike, I, I would happily take that in a yeah. heartbeat, any one of them. But Charlie floats the free kick over, Big Billy's timed his run perfectly. There's a famous picture with Bobby Lennox is sort of ducking out the road. Caesar comes through, the ball's in the net, and there's no danger, the cup is coming home. So, yeah. can you just imagine being there? I'm getting goosebumps talking and about it, wasn't there? I'm feeling can that off you. Just imagine that. There was a, Incredible stuff. I think it's really interesting that you've you've mentioned Charlie Gallagher. I'd like to touch yes. on him just briefly because yes. again, I, you know, I asked my own dad about these kind of stories, and he he says he was a seriously talented player, yeah. and I believe for a time he had a wee bit of being his bonnet. That, as you say, he was inverted commas only remembered for those two corners: the one against Dunfermline in '65, the one against Vodjvedina in the run to Lisbon. And I think the quote I've read is that it's actually his wife that kind of brings him back to reality and says, those corners have placed you in, in Celtic history and, and be thankful. And I think Forever. he ultimately was. But, and, and sadly, he, he lost his life uh, last July. So, you know, 
some of these guys are no longer with us, and it's it's amazing that we've got those stories, you know, you know, from them to, to pass on to the next generation. Yeah, but they live on in these stories. That's what I think. Charlie God rest in the live on in these stories. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the the fairy tale quality that Billy McNeil speaks yes. of it, and I've got it in my very notes here. I think it was at the centenary season when yes. Billy McNeil, as manager, spoke about the the fairy tale quality of its Celtic football club. But I suppose you've kind of touched on it. But do you think it was evident that day? Yeah, absolutely that day and I actually think it goes all the way back you're right but it was, Billy was talking about centenary team but when I'm, I'm, I'm writing obviously in my job I'm writing them in my tour job I'm talking about it some of these things Coronation Cup you know Celtic were 8th in the league up against mm-hmm. the, the absolute might of, of England and the, the swan through and won, the, won the, the tournament there's always there's always been a fairy tale there's always been a magic associated with Celtic long may it continue but that particular day that was Caesars one that was written for me. That for me, that story was written. The stars were, were, were twice behind to a you know maybe a technically superior op- the opponent, and that Celtic spirit comes through. It's a cup. And then I get I don't know all these guys for the past McGrory. They're all there. And suddenly Billy's that that ball was meant for Billy said, and that ball yeah. was meant for Lynette. Yeah, no right. doubt. And you you know you and I are from slightly different eras, Matt. You know, yep. kind of you've grown up at a, a different time in Celtic, and you know we've all got our own stories, but. Yep. I've mentioned my dad a couple of times. He frequently spoke about that cup final, not not yes. that season, not you know what was to transpire. That cup final, that day, twenty fourth yeah. of April, nineteen sixty five, is a day where everything changed. So I know the yes. book is about the year that everything changed for yes. Celtic. My dad's opinion and, and a lot of his you know friends and, and Celtic supporting friends at the time, that was a moment for them. He, he yeah. was at that cup final. So my dad was born in nineteen fifty. Okay, too young, six years of age to really remember nineteen fifty seven. Okay. I mentioned he went to the the first cup final in sixty one against Dunfermline. For some reason, he wasn't taken to the replay, and right. I think his uncle Tony used to take him and my uncle James to the games, and maybe he was working. We don't know. Sure. But he never made the replay. So when sixty five rolls around, my dad's fourteen years of age. He's he's high as a kite. Yes. This is this is it for him. This is you know the the, the peak at that point of his Celtic supporting life, yeah. and he's behind the goals for Billy McNeil scores that header, and he says he'll never forget it. You know, it's just something that. I don't know how many years have passed there. My, my maths aren't great. You know, sixty odd yeah. years have passed, yeah. mm-hmm. and he says he'll never forget that one moment in Celtic history. And my dad maybe finds it a wee bit harder to recall. Maybe things that happened under Gordon Strack and Martin O'Neill, <laughs> yeah. but he will never forget sixty-five. I think he actually That's says brilliant. that Uncle Tony tried to take him down the road early to get away from the crowd before the trophy presentation, <laughs> and he says absolutely not. That's not we're, happening. we're staying here. Yeah. But everyone of that era has got their own stories about. Yeah. You know that moment in Celtic history, and it's as you say, it's just so important to yeah. to keep these stories alive and to pass them on to the next generation. No, I mean that, that's a brilliant point. My my older brother, it was his first cup final as well, and I guess he in one of his one of his big birthdays, the kids got him this lovely framed picture of Billy scoring the goal in the program or whatever. See, that was his first cup final. Yeah. You never, I was going to say I remember my first cup final for the wrong reasons. <laughs> but if you're going to have a cup final, it's got to be that one. It's yeah. absolutely magic, and I love the point about passing that that. Bit. We are we are reliving Charlie's story and Billy's story and Bertie's story. We we're reliving and passing it on to guys that are maybe I don't know, twenty, thirty years younger. And I think that's a whole Celtic rite of passage thing. I yeah. love that. Yeah, it's, a, it's such a special These thing. These guys live Celtic. on in us. Absolutely. And and that's why it's I'll get to it a wee bit later on, yeah. but okay. I always appreciate very generally that you know the work that guys like yourself and David Potter do and you know, guys like Pat Woods that we've mentioned and, and just real club historians, Tom Campbell, the guys that take the time to yeah to pass on these stories to the next generation. It's so, yeah. so important. So, following that Cup success, and obviously that's a, you know, a huge part of the story here, but following the Scottish Cup success, Celtic then add the Glasgow Cup to the trophy cabinet with yep. wins over Rangers, Clyde and Queen's Park yep. and could now look forward to the 65-66 season with genuine, renewed optimism. We hadn't won the title in 12 years. Again, I'd mentioned that it was back in the 53-54 season with, yep. with Jock Steen as captain, but there was now genuine belief amongst the fans as well as the players that Celtic could lift the title with Jock Steen at the helm. That 65 Scottish Cup final was the, you know, the main focus of our chat here today, Matt, but yeah. can you touch on that next season a bit? Because obviously the, you know, the second half of the book mm. absolutely covers that in, in some detail. Yeah, yeah, we can. So I guess there's a couple of things came in. And the next Jock we mentioned earlier, <coughs> excuse me, we mentioned earlier about Jock looking at new players and we also talked about the Motherwell semi-final. On that, the two each game against Mother with Joe McBride scored both goals. And if I guess if Joe was in, I'm sure Joe was already looking at him, Joe had been around, he'd been down south, he'd played with Wolves, he were English champions at that time, been around a bit, scored a lot of goals. But that, I think the common, common perception is that, that Joe's performance that night sort of convinced Joe to sign him and he became Joe's first, certainly his first major signing. 
so which allowed again Yogi to move out to the left wing because you now had and Jimmy to play in the right wing and you now had Stevie Chalmers and you know, Steve, you know Stevie Chalmers and Joe McBride fine so all of a sudden you can mm-hmm. see that you can see the team taking shape there's a the, the first challenge domestic challenge of the new season is the League Cup uh, I'm certainly old enough to remember uh, I don't know about you, you do <laughs> that the League Cup started as it sort of does now but certainly in the old in the older days in the 60s and 70s the League Cup started the, the League Cup started the season so you had a sectional uh, you had a sectional four you played six games bizarrely they threw a league game in, a midweek league game in the middle and Celtic really had quite a, quite a tough start, but they managed to come through. They, they actually managed to lose two of their first three League Cup sectional games, so to right. all intents and purposes, were out mm. the League Cup before it had started. And then I see as the results combined, Celtic really get their act together in the last three games. They won the last three games. Big Yogi scores an absolute screamer up at Dundee, which David Potter again can, can, can talk about every blade of grass that Yogi yeah. covered to score that goal, a bit like the goal. Chap scored the other night, uh, saying that although that's maybe not such a happy memory. But Cel- Celtic, Celtic managed to qualify for a really tough Dundee, Dundee United, Motherwell, really really tough section, and then go ahead, Celtic, go ahead, go all the way through to the League Cup final. And I guess that's when the, that's when the next big challenge because waiting for the, waiting for them in the League Cup final would be Rangers and, and Rangers. I guess there's a sort of Rangers complex at Celtic Park at that time because. Yeah. You mentioned about the Ibrox, about the the nerdy hoodoo, if you like. But just in general, Celtic seem to, and I, I can relate this to even watching Tommy Burns go address them teams. The uh, Celtic would these games would would almost would almost follow a script. Celtic would play all this lovely football and attack, and then all of a sudden there'd be a refereeing decision would go against us or a goal or whatever, and all of a sudden they'd lose the game and lose their momentum. It was almost like you could set your watch by it, and that's what was happening here. Going all the way back to. 63 Cup final and all these league games. So the one thing, the one thing I guess Joke had, they had beaten them in the Glasgow Cup, uh, as you as you mentioned there. But what we hadn't done is beaten Rangers in a in a major cup final. And I guess the acid test was going to be in October. Mm-hmm. Would be beat when it was a rematch of the 64, which we'd lost. It followed exactly that script I've talked talked to you through. Would we beat that? In terms of the league business, we started off up at uh, Tannadice. John Diver scores a goal which would prove to be very, very significant. Another lovely man, yeah. John, John Divers, that maybe <clears throat> uh, scored over 100 goals for Celtic. And a, a, another guy that we should be talking about more, in my opinion. But John Diver scored a very significant goal, although we probably wouldn't know it would be significant at that time because it would end up being the first goal in the 9 year old, And that started. So the league, the league was a holy grail. The Scottish Cup, now in the bag, Celtic fans would probably still be feeling far more confident about having to go in the league but first and foremost, I think we had to beat this Rangers complex, and, mm-hmm. and I think that was probably be Jock's huge biggest challenge for the seconds for his first full season. Yeah, and it's funny that you know that that history's repeated itself in ways when it comes to a League Cup success being the the catalyst for further success. I always think yes. of Wim Janssen yes. and his team winning yes. that League Cup, uh, Coca Cola Cup I at the time, or whatever it was. Yeah. And then uh, Ange Postacoglu, you know, he's, yes. he's done it most recently. You know, uh-huh. less than a year ago, he, he won the cup final, beating Hibs two one, yeah. and that was a springboard for for league success. Yeah. And I suppose it's validation, isn't it? It proves to your players that what I'm telling you to do and what I'm asking you to do brings success. Yes. And the League Cup is often the first chance for any manager to prove that. So obviously, Steam yeah. came in and won the Scottish very early, which we've talked about. Yes. But then it was a whole new season and a whole new challenge, and. I suppose at that point, if it hadn't already sunk in for the players, yeah. they must have started to really believe in themselves. Because what I've picked up from the research and, and from you know D- David's notes and some of the chapters on the book is that some of the guys in the team were a bit disillusioned at the start of 1965. Billy yeah. McNeil's mentioned as a guy who wasn't enjoying his football and was considering yes. a move away. Bobby Lennox the same. Yes. Jimmy Johnson not enjoying his football, albeit still a young man in his early 20s at the time. So what do you think it was that... that Steam done to get these players on side is it that mental side of the game is, is there anything else I think Matt I don't know if it's your own quote I think it's your own quote that said football's won as much in the head as on the field was it done with yourself or David I'd love to claim that but yeah. It's yeah we'll cut on it's you for now yeah. anyway okay. but how important was the mental side and, and how Jock Steen built those dressing rooms in terms of getting the very best out of some of these guys no I mean that's that's right I remember reading uh, I remember reading Billy McNeil's bio- autobiography back, back in the day and I'm sure Billy was linked with Spurs. He was actually having quite a desperate time of things. 
and, and cle- clearly unhappy at Celtic. You mentioned Jimmy Johnson as well. The, the word is that Jimmy was actually considering giving up football. Uh-huh. Can you imagine Jimmy Johnson giving up football with everything he achieved in, in later years? Bobby was looking. <coughs> so it feels it feels very much to me at Celtic Park wasn't it? it wasn't a happy place to be. And Steen, for you know, Steen has turned that in its head, and you can only it can only be down to the influence and the, the, the folk. I don't think Steen, Jock Steen was particularly an easy manager to work under. For the we've talked about earlier, he never he never quite knew he wasn't a he wasn't a cuddly manager, but he certainly seemed whatever 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 he possessed, he seemed to be able to bring the best out in these guys. He seemed to convince them. The, the story goes that he bumps into Jimmy Johnson in the toilet of all places at a reserve game mm-hmm. and he said to Jimmy you know basically what are you doing here you, sh- you know you shouldn't be playing for the reserves so can you imagine Jimmy disillusioned maybe considering I'm going to go back to I think Jimmy was a welder to trade or whatever go back and get life this isn't working for me all of a sudden you're you know the chest's out and you're up and this guy actually rates me mm-hmm. and I can as I say I'd love to be I'd love to be there snapshot in time yeah. to, to see but Steen, Steen had seemed to have this this I don't know ability to convince players that they were, I don't know, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were capable of so much more. Mm-hmm. He turned, I mean, it's he turned a team of underperforming football players into the best team in Europe in two years. I kind of get my head around that. That's it, and it, it, it's my very next question. Oh, so he inherits almost everyone in the Lisbon lines. I think yes. Willie Wallace is maybe the yep. only one that he signs, brings yes. him in from Hearts in December 66. Yep. The other 10 starters in Lisbon on that day are already at the club already, by the time yeah, Steen yeah, arrives. Yeah, right. um, so as everyone knows, Matt, I don't need to labour on this, but Celtic yeah. reached the very peak of European football, beating Inter Milan 2-1 in Lisbon on the 25th of May 1967. Yeah. But as you mentioned there, it's a little over two years since coming in, so how do yeah. you take a team of underperformers, disillusioned guys, guys potentially looking to leave, yeah. guys maybe you know considering other options in life, go nowhere fast from taking them from there to the very top of, of European club yeah. football and it's, it's just incredible stuff and I wonder if supporters of that time were pinching themselves wondering just how Jockstein had managed to turn it around so quickly yeah, I mean you, you, can only, you can only imagine can't you you're, you're, to see you're, you're, on one hand you're, you're turning up at Hamden against them filming, you know put, hoping rather than expecting t- to win a cup final and within within two years you're taking on Inter Milan the best side in the planet for the you know to become the best side in Europe, yeah, I think that that's the ultimate. I think for me, Lisbon is the ultimate fairy tale. And you mentioned thirty thousand pound buys the Lisbon Lions. He goes to Willie, he goes to Hearts and gets Willie Wallace. And Willie Wallace, I think, was also another person who was disillusioned with football at Hearts uh-huh. and linked with Angels. Yeah. And Joke signed him, and, and, and the rest is history. It's, it's the most incredible story. The, the only the, the only other, other manager I think that our story even comes close to that. What Brian Clough achieved at Nottingham Forest. Brilliant. I think they were in the second division, maybe struggling in the second division, and he wins two European Cups with, with it pretty much the same. He goes and buys, sorry, he, he does buy Peter Shelton. But other than that, guys like Larry Lloyd and John Robertson or whatever, it's the same team. But St- you know, how, how Steen done that, I guess we'll never know. But he, the, the leadership qualities he came back you mentioned earlier I think Tino he came back as a a, bit of a journeyman player an average player but what Joke had was, was fantastic leadership qualities he becomes a captain Sean Fallon appoints Joke as his vice captain and Sean breaks his elbow and Joke becomes a captain in the coronation team and everything else and I think the leadership qualities it, it wasn't it, you know it, it wasn't a fluke he done it as a player he then went he, he had success with his elves he had success at Dunfermline success at Hibernian and his success at Celtic Steen had something Ultra special and listening to guys like Alec Ferguson, whatever, you know, they're, they're, they're revered Jock Steen, they revered Jockstein, you know, they followed his every word and they adopted a lot of his policies. I think Celtic and Steen were just a perfect fit at that time. And I, I, I usually open up my tours by saying we're talking about, you know, talking about what heroes we're talking about, Brother Walford and Willie Maley and Jimmy McGrory and I got into Jockstein. I think, you know, if it wasn't for Jockstein coming to Celtic as manager, I'm not sure I'd be doing this job. Yeah. I wouldn't have <laughs> folk from the States and Canada and whatever <clears throat> coming to find out about Celtic because for me, Steen turned Celtic from a, you know, a, a, I guess a Scottish institution, albeit a struggling one at that time, into, you know, just a world famous football team. Mm-hmm. And, and, and 50, what, 55 years down the line. We're, you know, we're still drawing that in, and it's Steen, Steen changed the world for Celtic. Yeah. it's a sliding doors moment. It's changed the world. Sliding doors was a term I was going to use yeah. there, and there's so many different things that play there. I, I remember um, just in the last few days, again, you know, reading up on things here about the fact that initially Bob Kelly says, "Why don't you come in as uh, you can be assistant to Sean Fallon?" Yes. No thanks. Yeah. I tell you what, why don't you be co-manager? Not no for thanks. me. I want to be the manager, and I want sole control. Yes. And again, there's part of that story. Um, 
are, are part of this story is, is how important the Scottish Cup final was because again I spoke about validation yep. it was also validation to guys like Bob Kelly to say oh hold on a minute yes. this guy knows what he's doing yes. let's give him full control and <laughs> the rest is quite literally history yeah. and it's funny as you're speaking here Matt you know I get quite animated you know just kind of hearing the stories and hearing the passion we all talk you know anyone that's interested or even has a passing interest in Celtic yeah. talks about how incredible Lisbon was and the story of Lisbon and it's fairy tale stuff and actually sometimes it can get easy just to say those words you know it rolls yes. off the tongue yes. but when you actually break it down and read stories like David's here and, and get the finer detail you, you can see, you know, just literally how incredible it really is. Yeah. You know, what we were, what what a journey we went through in sh- such a short space of time. We didn't get through our journey and become Glasgow Cup champions or just Scottish Cup champions. We were champions of Europe at a time where no non-Latin club had won it, at a time yeah. where yeah. the Inter Milans and others were completely dominating. And for a team that cost 30 grand within 30 miles radius of Celtic Park to do so... It will never be topped. Correct. It's, 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 Lisbon is the ultimate fairy tale, but you're right. It, there was there was a two year period where Steen came in and just gradually built that up. And there's another great point that you that I hadn't hadn't thought about before. Jock Steen, of, Jock Steen by his own admission, always wanted that job. So how much how much guts and courage must it have taken for him to potentially cost himself the job by taking that stance with such a dominant mm-hmm. guy as Bob Kelly. Yeah. Never really thought about that before. To, to not back the offer of getting in as assistant or co-manager and to say, no, if I'm coming in here, I'm doing it on my terms, yeah. at the risk of not getting the job, I think that I think that speaks volumes for him as well. He, he yeah. believed in himself to the point that he, he obviously knew that would be a difficult thing for Kelly to refuse him. So, it, it, the, he obviously had the ultimate self-belief. Yes. Again, you can see that in Ange Postacoglu, but I don't want to make yeah, this about no. Ange, but that self-belief thing is huge in football. Yeah. And for Jockstein at that time to just back himself and not be willing to bend, he was basically yeah. saying, I'm the main man or I'm not the man at all. Correct. And for him to have the, I suppose, the courage to make that yeah. stance for a job that he was so desperate yes. to get. Yeah. And, and we all know what played out. And now, obviously, knowing what we know about Jockstein, there was no way he could be assistant to anybody. No, <laughs> that's no. just not his world. Jock was a man. Um, so what we'll do, Matt. So obviously we're starting to, you know, kind of close things out and come towards yeah. the end of the episode. I'd like to ask you a couple of quick fire questions, if sure. you don't mind, sure. um, before I, you know, a couple of final pieces to finish on. Question one: We've maybe covered it, but maybe just you know your your short answer on it. If Celtic hadn't lifted the Scottish Cup in April 1965, how different do you think the future of the club might have been? Oh dear, what a question. Uh, well, I, I mean, it's, it's actually hard to imagine. Uh, I think I sort of alluded to it maybe a, a few minutes ago. If Celtic don't, if Celtic don't win that cup, Steen doesn't come back as manager. I just, I just, can't, I can't, I can't, I can't see, I can't see how, I can't see what following Celtic for the last fifty years. It's just been so totally different. It's, it's, it's a really difficult question, you know. Thanks yeah. for, thanks for throwing that one at me. <laughs> it's hard to imagine. Yeah. As a wee boy who grew up through that. It's hard to imagine. So I guess I guess the, the the common sense answer would be more of the same. So another, we had eight years of pretty much misery <laughs> between fifty seven and sixty five. So and I've talked about apathy creeping in. Do you know? I dread to think. I dread to think where it would go. Yeah. Please don't. Please don't take me there. I know it's, it's maybe taking you a dark place. I suppose. Dark place, I, I suppose, as, as you mentioned, you probably wouldn't have been doing the, the tour game yeah, stuff. You might yeah. have a few more uh, free Saturdays and I Mondays in your hand. You know, there's there's other ways to look at it, yeah, Matt. You'd never swap Lisbon for it. <laughs> Absolutely not. And I know it's such a difficult question to answer, but I just wanted to put it. Change the world for Celtic. That's how I describe it. Change the world. They change the Celtic's future forever. Yeah. Do you know? Couldn't word it any better than that, Matt. Spot on. Second quick fire question. So Bert Eld's return in 1965 was pivotal. We've covered yep. that. As yep. we had the goals of you know Yogi Hughes at that time and the creativity of Charlie Gallagher that we've mentioned. Yep. We all know about 67 and the, the contributions from various players, but who would you say was the most important player in that 65 team that Jock Steen took over? Oh. And I know it's going to be hard to pick one, but who would maybe be the key figure or a couple of key figures within that space? Okay. I'm, I'm probably going for three maybe four if I can if that's okay just go for 11 Matt that'll make it go for 11 <laughs> Fallon Young and Gemmel yeah. so uh, who would I go for certainly well Bertie's got to be there Bert, Bertie Old basically dragged Celtic back into the game with a scruff of her neck and Charlie Gallagher was instrumental for that but Bertie certainly for his goals Billy for his leadership qualities because the, the, the thing we maybe haven't touched on so much is the relationship between Jock and Sean and Neely and Bob Rooney, that backroom team, and so the backroom team and Billy is sort of lieutenant, if you like, on the pitch. Billy McNeil is pivotal to everything Celtic, and it's you know obviously Billy. Billy when I was a wee boy, 
there was like certainties in life. Jock was a Celtic manager, Billy was a Celtic captain, and Celtic won the European Cup as a Scottish champion. So yeah. it was about 15 before any of those factors changed. And the last guy is a, is a guy, sadly we lost, he touched the wrong, John Hughes. I think big, John, John Hughes, John's goals and his power were a huge factor in what Celtic done. And as you build on that, you bring in Murdoch. It's a, it does get towards 11. You start to bring on Bobby Murdoch been through. But if you're speaking specifically about 65, yeah. For me, you've got you've got you've got Billy McNeil, Bertie Old, and John Hughes. If I've, if I've stuck for three, you're probably upset at somebody, but if I've stuck for three, that's where I'd go. Fair enough, and can't argue with that. This is kind of separate to 65 and separate <clears> to the book, but it's just something that you coming up my head at the start of the recording. There's many figures immortalised at Celtic Park now. You know, you've got Jinky, you've got yeah. the Billy McNeil statue, you've got Brother Wilfred. Is there a place, or should there be a place for Jimmy McGrory? And for Willie Mealy. Absolutely. <coughs> Absolutely. Jimmy McGrory again. Talked about Ronnie being my hero. I guess your all time Celtic hero, Jimmy McGrory. You, you talked about 550 goals. I, I also played for St. Rock's Boys Guild, same as Jimmy. He actually just edged me in the goal scoring stakes by about 546. It was neat. neck and neck for very a while. Neat, very neat. But, uh, Jimmy McGrory, absolutely. And I'll go further than that, and people will laugh, but there's, I've actually got the statue in my mind's eye. Have you it's got the, it? The diving sta- header? Absolutely. It? It's a diving header against Aberdeen, which Another I think, one. Break, I think it's a December 35, and it breaks the world record, the world scoring record, and yeah. it's Jimmy always horizontal. And I guess what you don't see in the picture, it's a frozen, frozen pitch. And Jimmy missed her. Jimmy, goodness knows how many goals Jimmy would have scored if he'd been fit all the time because yeah. he, took, he took such a pounding and he missed so many games, you wouldn't believe. But that particular one, I think Jimmy scored a hat trick that day, 5 3 against Aberdeen. Jimmy is horizontal, and that's for me when I think about Jimmy McGrory, that's the pose. So I don't know, you have to have suspended animation for yeah. uh, that's a real challenge for a sculptor somewhere. But Jimmy McGrory, come up the Celtic way. Jimmy in that pose with the, with the ball flying in it, uh, absolutely uh, for me. I, I know the very picture, and I've got it in my mind's eye yeah. just now, you've very probably read or certainly aware, Matt, of the, the book Heroes Are Forever by John Kearney. Yes, I've got it. Have you got it? Yeah, and I've got it myself up. as well. Book. And that's either on the front cover, it's certainly within the pictures of that book. Yes. I, I can picture it clear as yes. day. It's such a striking image, and I, I'd love to see that Jimmy. somewhere yeah. uh, on the Celtic Bay. You'd mentioned your, your own goal scoring rate between yourself <laughs> and Jimmy. Between myself and Jimmy, we've actually got 550 goals for Celtic, so so we're, Brilliant. We're very much on Partnerships the obviously work well, Tiro. Um, so we've obviously we've gone off piste a wee bit there. But yeah, we couldn't couldn't have this chat, Matt, without talking about a guy who I know is a bit of a hero to you. I'd love to see him. Um moving back to some of the figures we've mentioned there. So, you know, very sadly we lost John Hughes just at the beginning of September. Uh, sorry, beginning of yeah, sorry, early September this year, twenty twenty two. Charlie Gallagher, as I mentioned, also yeah. passed away last year in July twenty twenty one. And of the Lisbon Lions side, only Jim Craig, John Clark. Bobby Lennox, Wally Wallace and John Fallon, of course, are still with us now. How important, Matt, do you feel it is that we keep telling these stories and, and sharing these memories with the next generation of Celtic fans through books like this one? Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, you, can't, you can't put a measure in that, in that you know, it's, 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 it's vital. The whole the whole rite of passage Celtic thing, it depends, it depends on the stories being shared. I mean, I've got so many questions I'd love to have asked my dad. When he was here, because you know we talked we, we talked about that earlier. There's, there's that there, there's those gaps in your memory. So one of the things I'm committed to doing is getting as much as possible down there <coughs> on paper, so that you know, 20, 30 years or whatever, people are still reading about. People are still David Potter done it earlier with Ali McNair. You know, yeah. as I say, the Celtic Star books. We try not just to focus on the, I guess the you know the, the legend, the acknowledged superstars. Guys like Alec McNair had a whole fabulous Celtic career, and pretty much nobody really knew about him. So that's a, I think there's a, you know, there's a, there's a, a dependency on, I guess, the Celtic writing community, if you can call it that, to make sure this stuff is defined and it's out there, it's enjoyable, and that that history is shared. Because on the tours, you see it. It's the grander, you know, mum and dad, the kids, you know, a baby in a pram, yeah. and I always make a point of saying. How many, you know, four generations of a family? Yeah. Fabulous, because seeing 40 years' time, this wee baby here will be telling the story about Charlie Tully or uh-huh. Billy McNeil or whatever. I think it's, yeah. it's crucial. I think it's what makes uh, all football supporters are passionate about the club, and absolutely that's the way it should be. But Celtic's unique. This whole fairy tale thing and all the other things about it is the charity thing. Celtic's unique, and a lot of that is because <laughs> I don't know another club, I don't know another club that has such a, I guess, a volume of, of, of written history that's shared and even as I say even today there's books coming out there's fabulous books out there coming out mm-hmm. and I'm, you know, obviously we're talking about Davis today but there's some brilliant writers out there some yeah. great Celtic books going out and 
Yeah, long, long may it continue. I love it that I'm a wee part of that. Yeah, and long may it continue. But I absolutely love that answer, Matt. And again, you can you can feel the passion coming across. What I also love, I hope the camera gets this, but there's a picture behind us. It's Billy. You know, it's a painting of Billy leading the players out in Lisbon. And before coming on air, Matt shows me that his dad and your uncle. Oh, Robert. Uncle Robert. Godfather. We're actually in the stand there, you know, kind of looking on the players and you cannot buy that Celtic. Yeah. That's phenomenal stuff. And I know you've got some pictures that your dad got from that day and maybe yeah. they'll see a later day sometime yeah. and, and maybe people will see see those pictures. But okay. such amazing memories and just so good to share and, and you just, you cannot buy it. And it's, again, I've been very genuine. It's guys like yourself and David and the various Celtic writers out there, whether you're writing about recent history or stuff yeah. that happened close to 100 years ago it's yeah. so so important to keep telling these stories what I would say Matt finally you know we've covered a lot here and it's you know it's been you know the ups and downs of 65 and what was going on I suppose yeah. I'd just like to ask at this point in the the episode for any final thoughts or comments as we as we start to close things out is there anything at all you'd like to add or mention that we've maybe not covered this afternoon I, you know either from a general point of view relating to 65 your own feelings towards Celtic, anything at all, just as we as we close things out. Oh, you put me right in the spot there. <laughs> uh, no, I guess I guess what I'll say a, a bit of a shameless plug. I don't really mean it to be, but if you if you enjoy your Celtic history, and that era means anything to you, that sort of sixty five, I think you will absolutely love it. David pours all his heart and soul into the book. It's a he it takes you on the journey. You feel his pain. And you feel his joy, and I think I, I think you'll absolutely love it. So apologies if that's a shameless plug, but. It's a, it's, a, it's a real fabulous new addition to what I say is yeah. I think an unparalleled selection of Celtic literature yeah I, I think it's you threw me with that one Tino you know. it's, it's a plug with a very genuine intention of sharing <laughs> those stories so it's yeah. to a huge extent it's less about selling copies of books it's more yes. and this is very genuine it's more about sharing those stories Get with the next read. generation of, of Celtic uh, Celtic supporters can you just give us finally just a wee sure. bit of detail Matt in terms of where people can pick up the book and when that's going to be available yeah available from celticstarbooks.com yeah. it's available from the Celtic Superstore Celtic have always been very supportive and it'll be available on Amazon as well so an ideal ideal Christmas gift I don't want to, I don't want to break people's uh, ruin people's day <laughs> by thinking about Christmas but uh, yeah. ideal Christmas gift for the sale in your life there you are Brilliant. a new so, career opens up for me that's it so it's going to be available very soon for anyone yes. that wants to catch it and Matt kindly shared some chapters with me and I'm looking forward to reading everything in full it looks like a very enjoyable read and as I'd mentioned you can just feel the passion from David and that's what I love about it I love just his genuine emotional first hand accounts of the various stages of that 1965 year and as Matt says available in various places CelticStarbooks.com Celtic Superstores and at Amazon from my point of view all that's left is for me to thank Matt once again for taking the time to share some of the stories from the Celtic Rising with me today and beyond that to very genuinely thank all those who continue to play their part in sharing the great history of Celtic Football Club it's important work and it's a genuine privilege for us at the Celtic Exchange to spend time with people like Matt as they share just what Celtic means to them. Finally, our thanks to you for listening to this episode and be sure to pick up your copy of the Celtic Rising when you get the chance and we'll see you again very soon. Mm-hmm.